Good morning. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome everybody to uh, Medicine Grand Rounds, where we uh, present the 12th Guller Family Cardiovascular Disease Prevention Lecture. Uh, a word about the lecture before I introduce the speaker. Uh, the Guller Lecture was initiated in 2011 uh, following a gift from uh, Cindy and Keith uh, Guller, who are in the audience today. And um, uh, <coughs> uh, with a uh, donation to the foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital. And the intent of this lectureship is really to educate uh, uh, everyone about the importance and advances in cardiovascular disease prevention. And uh, each lecture we bring a, a renowned speaker uh, known for their work uh, in this field. And the, the lecture topics are quite broad from molecular mechanisms of atherosclerosis to the epidemiology of uh, cardiovascular disease and clinical trials. And so I want to thank the, uh, the Gullers for supporting this uh, uh, lecture, uh, which has brought in multiple speakers uh, to Wash U. So today's uh, Guller lecture is Vera Bittner, who is a professor of medicine and uh, section head of general cardiology prevention and imaging at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She's also a quality officer for UAB Hospital and is a member of the Provider Integration Network and director of the Coronary Care Unit and Cardiopulmonary Rehab Program. Now, I've known Vera for several years. Uh, she is a consummate uh, professional and really is a uh, international uh, expert in the uh, field of cardiovascular disease prevention. She has been past president of the National Lipid Association, chair of the section of prevention in the uh, American College of Cardiology, as well as a uh, present, past president of the American Association for Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation, for which she was named master of that society in 2017. She, uh, uh, her research is focused on secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, especially lipid lowering ther therapies, cardiac rehab, and heart disease in women. And she's been really active in the clinical trial space, both uh, federally funded and, and uh, uh, industry funded trials for the last uh, three decades, uh, and has published over 200 uh, research articles and uh, currently is a senior guest editor for Circulation and serves on multiple uh, editorial boards. She's also an outstanding teacher and has won multiple teaching awards. And uh, I'm really uh, proud that she's a, a colleague and that she is uh, visiting us here today uh, to talk about LP little a and uh, atherosclerotic heart disease. So Vera, welcome. So, I mean, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Uh, thanks for inviting me here, and thanks to Cindy and Keith Guller uh, for making the visit um, possible. <clears throat> so what uh, I want to do is give you an update on LP little a and its relationship to a CDD. And so here are the learning objectives. So I want you to walk away from here to be able to interpret LPA measurements obtained by different methods. Uh, to know more about LP little a and the relationship to ACDD risk, and to be able to better counsel and manage individuals with elevated LP little a levels. And so here's the outline. We'll talk about what LPA is actually is, how we measure it, uh, discuss the relationship between LPA and cardiovascular risk, look at some approaches to risk reduction in individuals with high LP little a, and then I'll give you a glimpse into the future at the end. So let's start with what is LP little a. And so this is an old slide from a, a physician named Jerry Segrist, who used to be our pilot uh, many years ago, where he plotted the lipoprotein particles by density and size. And so in the upper right-hand corner, uh, you have these very huge color microns that are triglyceride rich. And then at the opposite spectrum, these small dense particles down here are HDL. And so here is the LDL zone. And the reason why I wanted to, you know, kind of put your attention to that is to point out that LP little a particles are basically a subfraction of the LDL fraction. So the cholesterol carried by LP little a in typical lab tests is measured in the LDL fraction. So when you get your LDL cholesterol back, you also measure the LP little a cholesterol, and we'll get, ba uh, you know, back to that uh, later. 
So this is a you know, schematic of this LPA particle. And so here you basically have the LDL particle, this big yellow blob, and then you have the uh, ApoB100 uh, that's wound around it, which allows it to interact with the LDL receptor. And then what makes LP little a unique is that you have that APO little a attached to it. And so for anybody who has gone you know, through medical school, I mean, this structure look, should look familiar to you because you've seen it in you know, all these Pringles uh, you know, in a row in plasminogen. But what distinguishes the APO little a from plasminogen is that the Pringle domains one, two, and three, they kind of went missing somewhere along the way. And the Kringle 5 and the protease domain are preserved, but the protease domain is inactive. And then what happened is that this Kringle 4 multiplied, and there are you know, 10 subtypes, 1 through 10. And the one that we you know, put some particular focus on is this uh, Kringle 4 2, because it can vary tremendously from person to person. So some people may only have two copies of this Kringle, other people may have more than uh, 40. And so this is uh, you know, another schematic of this APO little a. And here we, we see that the number of copies that you have of this Kringle 4-2 has a direct influence on the concentration of LP little a uh, in your plasma. So if you have one of these small isoforms, you tend to have much higher LP little a concentrations than if you have one of the you know, large isoforms. So this is a you know, fairly you know, standard depiction of the distribution of LP little a in the population. So this happens to be from the uh, Copenhagen General uh, Population Study, but it's reproduced through population to population that this distribution is quite skewed. So you have many people with very low concentrations and then a much smaller percentage that you know, ends up having you know, rather high levels you know, since that tail goes you know, way out to the right side here. Um, what you can see here is that the general shape of the distribution is similar between men and women, but women tend to have higher LP little a levels. And it's estimated that somewhere between 80 and 90% of your LP little a concentration is actually genetically uh, determined. So getting back to the APOA isoforms and the link to the concentrations, it, it turns out that the you know, number of Kringle 4-2 repeats tends to vary by ethnicity. And so this is data from the Dallas Heart Study. On the top, you have black participants, then white participants, and Hispanic participants. And you can see that the histograms of these number of Kringles look quite different. You know, where, uh, you know, black patients have predominantly, you know, smaller numbers, whereas Hispanics uh, tend to have the highest numbers here. And so that is reflected in the concentrations shown in that uh, you know, bar graph here. So you have uh, black uh, women and men, white women and men, and Hispanic women and men. And you can see that blacks clearly have the highest concentration followed by whites and then Hispanics. And here we can again see this sex dimorphism where you know, women in each ethnicity have higher levels. And uh, in the U.S., we can't do this real well because we don't have, you know, large population studies that, uh, you know, include sufficient number of Asians. So this is data from the U.K. Biobank, and it shows you that in the U.K., also this difference between whites and blacks is reproduced. But you also see that South Asians as a group have much higher levels uh, than uh, Chinese. And so if we look at this, you know, in a, at a global level, uh, you can see that the prevalence rates vary significantly uh, across uh, you know, different uh, continents. And we don't have time to go through this inner part here in detail, but what I want you to pay attention to is the overall prevalence, the number of people who have high LP little a in the various regions. And so you can see that there are over 400 million in Africa, 495 uh, million in the you know, South Asian region, and then in the US uh, we have you know, 75 million. So in aggregate, in 22, it's estimated that there are about 1.5 billion people who have these high LP little a uh, levels and whose cardiovascular risk uh, is largely affected by that.
You know, so I told you that, you know, the LP little a concentrations are largely genetically determined, and so it turns out that you can actually measure LP little a in cord blood in newborns, and the concentration that you measure at birth tracks through the rest of infancy, and it also tracks with your parental concentrations. And so this is shown here, that if you have a, uh, you know, LP little a that's at birth in the 90th percentile, uh, then you'll also be at 90th percentile in 15 months, and you'll kind of stay, you know, in that population uh, portion. And if the, you know, baby has, uh, you know, high LP little a levels, then generally more than, uh, I mean, one or more parents, you know, have the high LP little a levels too. And so that, you know, puts up some, you know, intriguing possibilities, you know, where you could have, you know, case detection basically at birth and then use it for cascade screening. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about measurement. And, uh, you know, people who know me know that I'm by no means a clinical chemist, so please don't ask me, you know, questions about the detailed ingredients that go in there. But suffice it to say that measurement of LP little a is very complex, and you can uh, Im imagine why. I mean, if you have one particle with a relatively short LP little, I mean, little a, and if you have one particle with a very long uh, little a, then having assays that measure both, you know, to the same degree is actually quite hard. Um, so there are assays that report out in milligrams per deciliter and uh, as a mass assay and then in nanomoles per liter uh, as particle assays. And so the guidelines now endorse these particle assays. But just because somebody reports out in nanomoles per liter doesn't mean that, you know, that's necessarily valid measurement. So you need to make sure that these assays are not sensitive to the length of that APOA, uh, you know, molecule, and so it's very important to use appropriate standards and calibrating. And the, you know, new kid on the block is mass spec, and that will likely become the gold standard for research, but I cannot imagine that every clinical lab is going to implement it. And so I thought what might be, you know, useful to you uh, kind of in the clinic when you get lab results from, you know, different labs to know what the approximate equivalents are. There's no single touch factor that will convert, you know, reliably milligrams per deciliter to nanomole, but, you know, it ranges, uh, you know, are equivalent. And so here it's the risk level from green to red, and then you have the equivalent uh, measurements in nanomole, milligrams per deciliter, and, uh, you know, percentiles. You know, so then the question is, you know, if these assays differ so much, you know, how do we interpret the literature about LP little a if one investigator group uses a milligram per deciliter assay, the other one uses nanomoles, the third one uses mass spec. <coughs> and so in the Odyssey Outcomes trial, which was a PCSK9 uh, inhibitor trial that you will hear, uh, you know, results from, uh, you know, in the remainder of the talk as well, you know, we had an opportunity to actually compare assays, right? And so the way that we did that is we basically, you know, had the mass assay that was in the trial itself, a molar assay by Roche, and a mass spec assay. And then what we did is we basically ranked individuals within each assay from, you know, low to high, and then compared these assays by looking at the, you know, uh, population, uh, you know, percentile. And so what, you know, this shows you here, this is the, you know, cumulative incidence of major uh, cardiovascular events in the placebo group, and you can see that the curves for these three assays, as long as they are standardized to the percentile of the population, are basically superimposable. And the same thing is seen here with the impact of, uh, you know, allorocumab versus placebo, so the hazard ratio is plotted here. Uh, you know, so again, I mean, these curves are largely superimposable. So in an individual kind of patient, uh, you know, it's difficult to judge, you know, from one assay to the other, but when you look at groups of people, you know, regardless of how you measure it, I mean, your results have, uh, you know, validity. And so now that, you know, we kind of know that regardless of, you know, how we measure it, uh, that, uh, you know, we can look at, you know, populations and see the risk, let's, and, you know, look a little bit what uh, diseases are actually linked to LP little a. So this is a summary by uh, Arsenault and Kantrup in atherosclerosis, uh, looking at the Copenhagen studies that I introduced you to earlier. And so there are strong links between LP little a and myocardial infarction, calcific aortic stenosis, heart failure, 
ischemic stroke, which is not always reproduced in all populations, uh, peripheral arterial disease, C mortality, and all cause mortality. Uh, and so, you know, with a risk factor that's highly prevalent and has such a big impact, uh, you know, we would want to make sure that this is actually a causal risk factor. And so let me try and, uh, you know, convince you of that in the next few slides. But first, I want to kind of discuss a little bit, you know, how LPWA increases risk. You know, the answer is that nobody knows for sure, and there are likely multiple mechanisms that are at work that may differ in importance depending on the population that you study. So LPWA is clearly pro-atherogenic. It's also pro-inflammatory. It's pro-oxidant. And it's pro-thrombotic anticarbonolytic. And the reason why I put a question mark behind it uh, is that some people show a fairly strong relationship uh, in other studies that doesn't come out as clearly, I mean, especially in relationship to, you know, venous thrombosis. And so this is classic epidemiology. So this is a graph from the emerging risk factors uh, collaboration, uh, typical meta-analysis plotting LPA on the x-axis and the uh, you know, risk of CHD on the y-axis. You can see that risk is fairly level at low LPA levels, and then it goes up fairly steeply as you get beyond about you know, 24 milligrams per deciliter here. But that's you know, association and not causation. And so can we get a little bit closer to, you know, convincing you that this is a causal risk factor? So this is GWAS data from an LPA genetic score. And so here you can see that risk plotted as the odds ratio here tracks with the number of variant alleles that you have. And then, you know, and I can only show you one in the interest of time, but there are now many Mendelian randomization studies that show quite clearly that genetically predicted LPA tracks with uh, CHD risk. So I, mean, I think it's clear right now that LPA is a causal risk factor. It's a prevalent risk factor. But at this point in time, we still don't really know what to do with it. So let me, let me give you some scenarios then where I think even in the current era where we still don't have specific treatments, you know, measurement of LPA can be helpful to you. And so one specific population is familial hypercholesterolemia. And so as you know, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia is basically diagnosed through high LDL cholesterol level. Uh, you know, when you use classic clinical criteria and don't do genetics on it. 30% um, of LPA mass approximately is cholesterol. And I told you earlier that LPA is measured in the LDL fraction. And so it's clear that if somebody has very high LPA levels, they may actually contribute to what we think is a clinical familial hypercholesterolemia diagnosis. And so it's estimated that about 25% of individuals with uh, clinical FH may receive this diagnosis on the basis of high LPA. So that's the main take on point, uh, you know, in the clinic, if you have somebody who you think has heterozygous FH, you know, think about that high LP, uh, LPA may play a role. And then in this population, just like in the you know, regular population, if you have heterozygous FH and then you have high LPA in addition, you're at particular high risk. So let me take you through this graph. So here's no FH, here's FH, and then in each one we have low LPA and high LPA. And so in the no FH group, we have this increase in risk that we saw. We also know that FH patients are at higher risk than no FH patients in general, but if you have high LPA in addition, your risk is about five-fold higher than a no FH patient with normal LPA. So, I mean, that makes, I mean, a fairly significant difference in, uh, you know, prognostication and, you know, should help guide, uh, you know, how aggressively, you know, you treat these individuals. And then we also know, uh, you know, from the, you know, statin trials that there is a considerable amount of, you know, quote-unquote residual risk. And I mean, it's a term that's clearly been overused. Uh, some of this residual risk is probably lipoprotein dependent, others relates to poorly controlled blood pressure and smoking and so on and so forth. But what is shown here in this, you know, meta-analysis by, you know, Peter Willite is that in the placebo group of these trials that are listed up here, and this, this was a patient-based uh, meta-analysis, so not just taking the published paper. You can see that in the placebo group, uh, the group that had high LPA had an increased risk with a uh, hazard ratio of about 1.26. 
Um, when you look at the static treated group, you know now that you've taken a lot of the LDL cholesterol-based risk out of the equation, then the impact of LP little a is actually a bit higher. I mean, the confidence intervals overlap, but nevertheless, the point estimate is higher than uh, in the placebo group. So in our secondary prevention patients, uh, we can also use LP little a for you know, risk stratification whether they're treated or you know, not. And then what about you know, in primary uh, prevention? Because in primary prevention, you have you know, a spectrum of risk going from you know, minimal to you know, fairly high. And so they looked at this in the UK Biobank, and they used the Joint British Society's free lifetime risk calculator. And so the graph is a bit complex. So we have the baseline risk that comes out of this calculator on the x-axis. We have the actual you know, CV event percentages on the uh, y-axis. And then along the z-axis, we have the increase in concentrations of LP little a. And so the numbers in these columns represent the incremental risk that you have uh, in for any given LP little a levels in comparison to your baseline risk. So if you have a baseline risk of 5% and uh, you have the highest LP little a level uh, you know, that they uh, plotted here, you have an incremental risk of 8.6. So that puts you up to about 13.6% uh, risk. And so that puts you in a different uh, you know, risk threshold for you know, medical therapy. And look how you know, badly we can miscalculate if somebody is at high baseline risk. So if you have a baseline risk of 25%, an incremental risk of 43% based on this very high LP little a, uh, then you think you have a 25% risk patient, but that person actually has a 68% uh, you know, lifetime risk. So I think it's useful to think about you know, LPA as a you know, risk enhancing factor, the way that it's depicted in the US guidelines right now, and to try and actually quantitate it because the impact will vary from patient to patient depending on how high the LP little a is. And so then you know, there's an interesting question, and this just came out in uh, Jack uh, you know, in January, is if you look at it on a per particle basis, I mean, if you compare an LPA particle and an LDL particle, which one is actually more dangerous to you? Um, in this paper, uh, the authors took advantage of the fact that both particles have exactly one APOB you know, on their particles. So you can standardize the two populations based on you know, APOB. And so what they ended up doing is that they looked at genetic clusters that predicted LDL, but not LP little a. And they looked at genetic clusters that predicted LP little a, but not LDL. And uh, then they you know, plotted these risk curves of the genetic effect on APOB for the two particles. And you can see, yes, there is a strong relationship between genetically predicted LDL APOB, uh, but the you know, slope of the curve is much flatter than the relationship between uh, uh, CHD risk and the genetically predicted APOB in LP little a. And so what the investigators you know, estimated is that on a per particle basis, that LP little a is six times as atherogenic. And I, mean, I don't like that word. I mean, that's what was used in the paper. But what they're really saying is that you know, the CHD risk is six times uh, higher. But you know, so does that mean that we should you know, abandon LDL now? Uh, because that's how it came out in some of the press reports. And I had all sorts of patients telling me that I was re uh, treating the wrong particle. Um, so in the majority of you know, people, we have many, many more LDL particles than LPA particles. So if you look at the sum of risk by all the LDL particles and the sum of risk by all the LP little a particles, then I mean, most of the risk still resides in the LDL you know, particle fraction, except in some individuals who have you know, skyrocketing LP little a levels. All right, you know, so how would you actually do this in the clinic? So um, Brian Ferentz, uh, who is at Oxford, uh, uh, you know, created an LPA risk calculator. 
Um, and so here on the left-hand side, you pretty much have the you know, standard risk factors. The only addition to the calculators that we're used to uh, is that they also put body weight in it. Once you plug all your numbers in, and I couldn't get that on the slide, there's like a slider bar down here where you enter your LP little a concentration, and then this calculator spits out curves of what your risk is like with and without, uh, you know, LP little a. And so this is a good way, uh, you know, to visually, you know, uh, get that point across to uh, patients and also to, you know, kind of realize yourself. Uh, you know, how much of an impact, uh, you know, any given concentration has in your specific patient. You know, so one of the, you know, prerequisites, though, uh, is, you know, if you want to use LP little a in this stratification, you know, then you actually have to measure it. And so these are data from 2012 to 2021 that were published in JAHA in 2023. And you can see that it's an infinitesimally small number, you know, even in high-risk populations, you know, people who have a premature family history of CVD or people who have a personal history of CVD. And so we can obviously do, you know, a whole lot uh, better, you know, kind of incorporating that risk factor into our, you know, day-to-day -day clinical routine. All right, you know, so now I've shown you that LP little a is a causal risk factor. So we've talked about, uh, you know, measurement. Uh, you know, so what do we do now if we have somebody with high LP little a in the test? And so um, what I'm listing to you for you are, quote, potential approaches to mitigating LP little a risk because we have really no randomized data that show that any of these approaches, you know, have a significant, uh, you know, impact. So let me show you what we actually do have. So one approach is, you know, if you know that you have high LP little a, let's go ahead and treat all the other risk factors that we can do something about to optimize your ACVD risk. So get you out of this 25%, you know, risk bar that I showed you earlier and move you down toward the left to like a 10% or so risk, you know, so that, I mean, the impact of high LP little a will be smaller. And that is basically, you know, part and parcel of what we're, you know, doing or supposed to be doing anyway, you know, counseling, diet, exercise, smoking cessation, get all the other lipoproteins at target, optimize blood pressure, you know, according to the data that we have from the SPRINT trial, address metabolic factors, et cetera. You know, so one intriguing possibility is that there may be, <coughs> you know, a selected population where, you know, aspirin actually may have an impact. And again, I mean, this is not randomized data. These are post hoc analyses of randomized aspirin trials. <coughs> and the one that came out first was an analysis from the Women's Health Study. There was a, you know, comparison of aspirin versus placebo. And so they divided people into carriers and non-carriers of this particular SNP that confers a very high LP little a concentration. And so you can see if you are a carrier on placebo, your risk is quite high uh, in the study of having a cardiovascular event. But if you were fortunate enough to be randomized to aspirin, then your risk was basically equivalent to the rest of the population. So it could be that in, you know, this kind of primary prevention setting that aspirin may make sense for people with very high LP little a levels. Um, similar analysis from the ESPRI trial. Uh, the overall trial was null. So they had just as many major adverse cardiovascular events as bleeding events, so really no, you know, benefit. <coughs> but when they looked at that same, uh, you know, SNP, the number of mates that were prevented were 11.4, and the excess bleeds were 3.3, so there was a fairly substantial you know, net benefit, and that interaction between having the SNP and aspirin therapy <coughs> was uh, you know, uh, is statistically significant. And when you had just an LPA you know, risk, genetic risk score, then the net benefit was a little bit smaller, but it was nevertheless uh, you know, present. So again, kind of intriguing data, but you know, no, you know, formal randomized trial. There's also some data out of the um, PCI literature. And there are a couple of more papers, but I thought this one had a, you know, a, a nice uh, graph where they could show this uh, easily. <coughs> this shows the impact of LP little a in relation to duration of dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI, and it's from a, you know, big registry. 
And so on the left-hand side, we have the people with low LP little a. And so when you compare people with longer duration versus shorter duration, there was really no benefit in all-cause death in my stroke. There was probably a little bit of reduction in stent thrombosis, but there was also a point estimate that suggested that there was excess bleeding. And so when you look at the subpopulation of individuals with high LP little a, they had benefits in cardiovascular events, they had benefits in stroke, uh, I mean in uh, stent thrombosis, and they had no increased risk in bleeding. So again, I mean a post hoc analysis, not a randomized trial, but at least something to think about in very high risk subpopulations. So what about standard pharmacologic therapy? When you look at the guidelines in Europe, uh, they actually suggest that niacin is a reasonable way you know, to treat uh, LP little a, and that's due to the fact that you get fairly robust reduction. Um, you know, on this side of the pond, I think people are a little bit more skeptical with that because at least in the trials that you know, looked at niacin in the modern era where people had a statin background, the overall trial was null, so there was no benefit. Um, they showed that uh, baseline and on trial LP little a were risk factors for events, but they you know, didn't show that the niacin really made any difference. Um, estrogens and to a lesser degree progestins can also lower uh, LP little a, but in this big meta-analysis where a lot of you know, these trials were nicely summarized, uh, there was no overall MACE reduction. So whatever reduction you might get because of the APOA change, um, you know, the LP little a change, uh, you know, it's offset by, you know, other events. Then there was one, uh, you know, type of lipid lowering medication, a CPP inhibitor uh, named Anaxacapid. It had fairly robust LP little a reduction, but the MACE reduction was fairly small, and they didn't actually look to see whether LP little a mediated this. And then last but not least, we have apheresis, which you can think of as kind of a dialysis for, you know, LP little a uh, particles. And there the observational data suggests that that may have benefit. Uh, they compare event rates before being put on apheresis and event rates after. But that's obviously, you know, a highly selective way of analyzing the data. And to my knowledge, at least, there's no randomized control trial out there. So let me then kind of show you a little bit of data that came out of the PCSK9 monoclonal antibody trials. And just to remind you, there were two big trials, Fourier and Odyssey outcomes. Fourier had stable ASCVD, Odyssey outcomes had a population of people within a year of acute coronary syndrome. Uh, Fourier used Evolocumab, Odyssey, Elevocumab, and, uh, you know, relatively short duration of follow-up and, you know, similar, you know, outcomes measures. And so when we looked at the distribution of LP little a in Fourier and in Odyssey outcomes, I mean, take home number one is, yes, there's also a skewed distribution there, but the levels are much higher than in the general uh, population. So it suggests that people with high LP little a are selected for these trials because they've already had an event. And when we compare the two trials, even though, I mean, this conversion factor down on the bottom needs to be taken with a little bit of grain of salt, uh, the, you know, concentrations were uh, a bit higher in Odyssey outcomes than in Fourier. And so, you know, in Odyssey outcomes, you know, we looked to see whether the degree of LP little a lowering that we saw in the trial overall was contingent on what your baseline uh, LP little a uh, was like. So here you have the lowest quartile of LP little a, here you have the highest quartile of uh, LP little a, here you have LDL reductions that are fairly constant across the quartiles, and then here you have increasingly uh, important reductions in LP little a. And so um, when we, you know, then uh, look at this, in, you know, the, the outcomes in Odyssey by LP little a um, baseline you know, quartile, you can see that the risk reductions were higher in the two top quartiles than in the two bottom quartiles. So that suggests that Alavocumab had a, you know, significant benefit in, you know, people with higher LP little a that was more pronounced than in the people who had lower LP little a. And Fourier looked at the same thing. So here uh, we can just look at the left-hand side, the above and below median. Um, so we have the blue 
placebo group. So you can see that the folks with high LP little a had higher event rates in Fourier than the ones with lower LP little a. So reproducing the risk factor, you know, kind of relationship that I told you earlier. And you can see that there's at least a suggestion that the impact of Everlocal map was greater in the high LP little a group than in the low LP little a group, even though this interaction was, you know, barely, uh, you know, past the significance level. So both Odyssey and uh, you know, Fourier suggest that people with high LP little a benefit more from uh, PCSK9 inhibition. And so in Odyssey, we then took it a little bit further. Um, we had pre-specified that you know, one of our other outcomes would be total cardiovascular events instead of just you know, time to first event. And so this is a post hoc analysis, but looking at total CD events. So here you see the four quartiles of LP little a that you're already familiar with. This is the reduction in LP little a by map at four months. So basically no effect in the first quartile, five milligrams per deciliter, almost 10, and then 20 milligrams per deciliter, and that's the you know, average reduction for the whole uh, trial. And so you can see here that for the LPA median reduction, which is this five milligrams per deciliter, there is increasing benefit in terms of reduction in CV events as you get to higher and higher uh, levels of baseline LP little a. And so uh, our statistician uh, you know, built a model to try and distinguish how much benefit was accrued by the classic LDL cholesterol reduction and how much was accrued by the LP little a reduction. And so per median reduction of you know, LP little a, there is a 13% reduction uh, that uh, is due for, uh, you know, in the overall group. But look that in the high LP little a group, about 39% of the benefit that was seen was actually due to the LP little a reduction. So that is, I mean, in uh, our minds, at least a you know, potentially clinically meaningful uh, benefit. And so this you know, hypothesis you know, generating finding uh, will be put to the test in trials that are ongoing now. So um, I stole a slide from Michelle O'Donoghue who showed this at uh, AHA uh, 23. And that you know, depicts to you the key phase two and three trials of various novel therapies that are specific to LP little a reduction. Uh, you have antisense oligonucleotides, and you have silencing RNAs that basically prevent the you know, synthesis of LP little a particles. And then you have a uh, small molecule inhibitor uh, that I'll you know, show you uh, results from uh, that can actually be taken orally, whereas all the other ones uh, you know, are injected. And these you know, agents are very different from the PCSK9 inhibitors in terms of the amount of LP little a lowering that you get. So for uh, you know, alpazarin and uh, lepidizurin, um, you know, you, at higher doses, you basically eliminate LP little a from the circulation. So it's you know, almost like a 100% you know, uh, reduction, and that is sustained. Um, with uh, the you know, small oral uh, you know, compound, it actually binds to, you know, a couple of these, you know, kringles and then prevents the attachment to the ApoB. And so it doesn't have quite as much potency, but nevertheless has a about 60% reduction in LP little a, again, vastly higher than what we see with, uh, you know, PCSK9 inhibitors. So, you know, if these studies become positive, we may have, you know, a totally new uh, uh, you know, method of treatment in our uh, armamentarium. But you know, there, there's also some question of what will happen when you reduce LP little a by 100%. Because you know, one thing that I haven't addressed is you know, why we actually have LP little a. Because Homo sapiens and the hedgehog are the only species that have LP little a. And so we have no idea why that you know, basically evolved twice. And we really don't know what LP little a is actually supposed to do. I mean, there's some hypotheses you know, that it may have to deal with wound healing and things like that, but I mean, nobody knows for sure. So we don't know whether you know, this massive reduction in LP little a is going to have any sort of adverse effects. And I wanted to show you one aspect uh, that might be worth you know, keeping an eye on. 
and that is the relationship between LP little a level and diabetes. So this is epidemiologic data, again, uh, from the you know, Copenhagen study that shows you that low LP little a concentration uh, are beneficial for cardiovascular events, but are associated with greater rates of diabetes. You know, so here you have the depiction for a plasma lipoprotein. So if you have low uh, LP little a, uh, low MI, increased diabetes. Uh, if you look at genetic predictors of uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> higher levels, then you see greater diabetes in people where you look specifically at the number of repeats of the Kringle four that, uh, two that I showed you earlier, but you don't see it with kind of a standard genetic you know, risk score. And so what people have argued is that we may not really need to be worried about this because if we have medications that lower LP little a, they're not gonna go and change the isoforms, presumably, uh, you know, they're just gonna go and lower overall levels and so maybe we don't have to worry about. But, you know, we have, you know, a little bit of data from, uh, you know, RDC outcomes that suggests that, you know, there may be, you know, a small impact. So in Odyssey, uh, participants with diabetes had lower levels of LP little a than those without diabetes. So that is you know, the basic epidemiologic relationship that you see in large populations, low LP little a, a you know, little bit greater you know, diabetes. Um, in aggregate, when you look at diabetes incidence during follow-up in Odyssey outcomes, alarocumab had no impact. Uh, if anything, I mean, the hazard ratio is actually a little bit uh, you know, on the beneficial side, but not statistically significant. But look what happens when you look in the placebo group um, by baseline LP little a and look at the incidence of diabetes during the trial. So this is the placebo group, no effect. So if you have low LP little a, you were more likely during the follow-up to develop you know, diabetes than if you had you know, high LP little a. And that's presumably the reason why already people with low LP little a had more prevalent diabetes. So that just basically plays out, you know, the natural history. So we can look at this bar graph a little bit different, and that is with, you know, something called a spline. So it's basically a continuous relationship. So if you again look at the blue placebo group here, this is LP little a going from low to high. So you're Incident diabetes, the likelihood that you develop diabetes in the uh, you know, trial was substantially lower as you got to higher LP little a levels. And so now compare the curve for the alarocumab you know, treated group. So it's basically flat at you know, lower levels of LP little a, and then if anything, it kind of goes a little bit in the opposite direction. And so Again, I mean, just with modeling, because this is not mechanistic kind of type science, but with modeling, it suggests that for every 10 milligram per deciliter lowering of LP little a by alarocumab, there was about an 8% adjusted increased risk of developing diabetes during the trial. And, you know, and this recapitulates a little bit the story with you know, statins and LDL lowering, where you also have an impact on increased uh, uh, you know, uh, diabetes, but the net outcome is still very much on the side of benefit, both for statin treatment and for, you know, PCSK9 inhibitor therapy. So let me kind of, you know, summarize, you know, a little bit then what I'm hoping that you'll take away from that. So high LP little a increases ASCVD risk. It's a causal risk factor. The prevalence of high LP little a varies by sex and ethnicity, and worldwide there are a lot of people who have high LP little a. You know, please measure LP little a in your patients for risk stratification. It's already part of the guideline uh, in Europe, and here, I mean, a number of consensus statements have pointed the same direction. You know, optimize control of non LP little a related risk. In selected people, consider you know, aspirin or you know, other antiplatelet therapy, but make sure that you do it in the context of shared decision making because you don't have you know, really strong uh, you know, uh, clinical trials behind you where you could you know, quote unquote be dogmatic. And then in high risk patients, since we now think that part of the benefit 
uh, in these high-risk patients treated with PCSK9 inhibitors, that it may be worthwhile to you know, think about using that as you know, add-on therapy. And then last but not least, I mean, please stay tuned because there will be an avalanche of data uh, related to uh, LP little a coming down the pike, and your patients will ask you about it, so it's going to be well worth your while to you know, stay up to date. And so um, thank you very much for you know, inviting me. Uh, thanks to my collaborators in Odyssey Outcomes uh, so that I could show you, uh, you know, the data. And again, thanks to uh, you know, Cindy and Keith Geller for allowing me to come. Much appreciated. <laughs> and then I guess you're supposed to go and scan this CME mock uh, you know, thing for your credit. <laughs> Thanks for that wonderful presentation there. Um, questions from the audience, maybe a, uh, yeah. go ahead, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, that is a superb question, right? You know, uh, I, th I think this thing is working, yeah. You know, so I mean, it's a superb question because, you know, many of the data that I showed you were obtained in predominantly white, you know, Caucasian populations, right? Uh, you know, so A, I mean, I think we need, you know, studies that have a much larger group of you know, folks from different ethnicities so that we can look at the shape of the curve. I mean, I think that the relationship with higher LP little a confers risk, that will be true. But will this curve look like this or will it be flatter? You know, that all remains to be determined. Right now, we basically have average values that are dominated by Caucasian uh, population, simply you know, the way that the you know, studies were made up. I think the UK Biobank probably has the greatest diversity, uh, but to my knowledge, they haven't really published you know, individual data curves that, you know, where they felt confident enough that they could actually say for a South Asian, the cutoff should be this, for you know, an African American should be that, or, you know, uh, whatever. So, uh, but I mean, it's a very important question. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so it's true. I mean, I, I showed one slide of it, you know, because in an hour, I mean, it's kind of hard to go and cover all the different outcomes with it. But I showed one slide earlier, maybe before you came in, uh, from the Copenhagen study that showed, you know, relationships not just with CHD, but also aortic stenosis, PAD, you know, stroke, uh, and so on and so forth, and, you know, heart outcomes like cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. Yeah, and, and, and that's correct, you know, and so, you know, the bigger your background risk is, you know, the more of an impact, you know, additional LP little a has. And that was what underlies this, you know, treatment approach that uh, kind of suggested that if you have somebody with high LP little a, you know, treat 
the background risk, you know, to lower the overall risk level so that the incremental, you know, risk isn't quite as high. So, uh, and it also probably means that, you know, some of the estimates, you know, that have been made from Mendelian randomization, how much LP little a lowering you actually need to change outcomes are probably off because the degree of LP little a lowering that you need may be much less in a population in a very high risk environment than in you know, the majority of people who will have much lower risk. On the other hand, if you live in a hotbed of cardiovascular disease, you know, as I do, you know, kind of practicing in Birmingham, you know, which is like the you know, center of the stroke belt and the center of every CDC map that shows you, you know, how we excel in risk factors, I mean, pretty much all my patients you know, follow, uh, you know, fall into a fairly high risk category. Farhan? There are several ongoing, uh, but I don't know how close they are to beating out. You know, and so, I mean, that's obviously, you know, important, but, you know, we end up probably in that same quagmire to some degree that we had with, you know, LDL lowering, you know, because when statins first came out, we had data from angiographic trials, and then later on with IBIS and stuff that basically nobody believed until you had the big outcomes trial that showed that you actually had changes in event rates. So I mean, I think that they're nice mechanistic studies, and they kind of tell us that we're moving in the right direction, but they're probably not going to be sufficient to convince people that this is actually the mechanism by which you know, uh, these treatments then uh, benefit patients. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, right now, I mean, my approach is basically the one that also the European guidelines suggest, and that is measure LP little a once. There is one caveat with that. There is an increase in LP little a as women transition through menopause. Uh, and so if somebody is kind of borderline uh, LP little a one day younger, it may be worthwhile to kind of reassess that in, in the postmenopausal stage and kind of see you know, whether there's incremental you know, risk there. Um, so one single measurement. And the reason why I don't do serial measurements is because right now all I can do is really address the initial risk factor. I don't know what my target level is supposed to be in all these kinds of things. And I think it's just going to confuse patients and they're going to go and you know, quit taking their medicines unless I can show them that I made a big impact in it. Um, and so I basically you know, follow people. You know, once I kind of have in my mind how much of their uh, you know, risk is you know, LDL mediated and uh, you know, LP little a mediated, I just follow them by standard lipid profiles. Um, because you know, even ApoB is a send out test at my place, so I mean, it takes longer to get back. And so I'm more of a lumper than a splitter. So I mean, if I have any doubt about things, then I can always look at non-HDLC and get kind of an idea, you know, what the overall aggregate of ApoB particles is. Uh, Vera, maybe I could ask one, and then we'll talk far on. Uh, just along those same lines, so you showed how LP little a tracks with LDL levels in terms of risk. Does it track with residual inflammatory risk? People have looked at that. There's, you know, and we have I mean, one small study, uh, you know, out of Odyssey, you know, suggesting that LP little a has, you know, incremental impact in people with high CRPs. Um, what I don't think anybody has really done yet, because we don't have good agents to lower LP little a in graded fashion, to see whether CRP levels and uh, IL-6 levels and so on and so forth and oxidized phospholipids go down incrementally, you know, as LP little a gets lowered. So I mean, that's I'm sure you know going to be part and parcel of every biobank that you know on those trials that I showed you. Uh, Mark.
Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a good question, but since I'm talking to insurance companies pretty much about everything that I want to do these days, it's I mean, not <laughs> unique. Um, you know, the, I mean, the effort obviously is there to remove obstacles to it. And, uh, it, you know, one obstacle for a long time was that you didn't even have a billing code you know, for it, right? And so, I mean, I took that slide out because I was uh, wanted to leave plenty of, uh, you know, room for, you know, questions, but, I mean, there is a code for family history of LP little a, and there is a code for high LP little a, you know, so that will, you know, make your lab happier so that they, you know, can attach the correct, you know, code to it. Um, insurance companies generally in the secondary prevention folks that I see have less of a problem with it than if they, uh, uh, than if it's a, you know, kind of what they consider worried well person, you know, who wants to just have their, you know, level measured and is otherwise at low risk. But I haven't gotten too much, uh, you know, pushback. I'm, I have much harder time getting the drugs to potentially treat it, you know, uh, you know down the road. So, and by the way, sorry that you broke your foot. I see this giant cast on your... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, one, time for one final question, uh, Farhan. Uh, again, excellent talk. I have a bunch of questions. So I'll just keep it fast and then right now, since so much interest in BLP1 agonists seems to be uh, mostly systemically beneficial for our patients, anecdotally, I see patients with 20 pounds, 30 pounds, and all their blood pressure medicines come off their statin program. Have you seen a signal for LP little a lowering with LP, BLP1 agonists? I, I haven't seen it. If it's out there, uh, you know, I missed it. Uh, but I'm sure that people will look at it at some point in time uh, because if that's going to go and become, you know, standard of care down the road, I mean, we really need to understand, you know, what these drugs do. But it's, I mean, it's a superb question. Okay. Let's uh, thank Dr. Bittner for an outstanding presentation. Thank you.